Kun is tea. How are ye? Welcome to the Candlelit Tales podcast, where we tell stories from Irish mythology and folklore and chat about them afterwards. In this series, we are looking at the classics of Irish mythology, telling and retelling them. If you don't know a lot about Irish myths, you might know these. And if you're just starting out, it's probably a good place to start here. This story is Deirdre and the Sons of Ishnuk. It is a beloved, tragic tale of forbidden love and loss and exile and, and as is pretty standard with Irish love stories, this is a story where anything that can go wrong is going to go wrong. This podcast is brought to you by our supporters at Patreon. You can join them over at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or you can make a one-time donation using the PayPal button on our website. Like, share, comment and above all, enjoy. And for now, Aaron, tell us a story. Deirdre of the Sorrows One of the Three Sorrowful Tales of Irish Mythology A terrible screech and screaming rang out throughout the entire feasting hall where the Crave Rua were gathered. All of the men were shook and stopped what they were doing. Everyone went quiet. They all looked to the King Krohor Magnassa, who was staring at his own druid, Kaffa, his long white beard, almost the same hue as his skin now coloured white from the fear that was striking him. His hands held out towards the pregnant belly of the woman of the house. They were all in Felimon Bigdal's house, of course. This, the storyteller of Crohor Magnassa, the great man who could play such beautiful music on the harp and tell such great stories, had asked the king to come in and celebrate with him and his pregnant wife so they could revel in each other's company, tell stories, sing songs, drink and be merry before the day his wife gave birth. But when Kaffa the druid went close to Phelamid's wife and placed his hands near her belly, the child screamed such a terrifying scream, such an otherworldly screech, that no one spoke a word. Everyone looked and wondered, what was this terrible omen? What did it mean? Crohor Magnassa was just a young king, and he sat bolt upright, staring at Kaffa, who placed his hands steadily on the belly of Phelimid Macdall's wife. His eyes rolled back in his head then, and suddenly he spoke with a clarity that they knew he was seeing through the other eye, his second sight. His eyes widened, only the whites showing as he rolled up into the back of his head with his eyes wide, and he spoke. This child will be called Deirdre. Her beauty will be unparalleled, and the fighting for her hand will cause such a rift through the Crave Rua. It will split it in two, and more blood will flow out the halls of Owen Maka than are beating in the hearts of the men and women listening in this room tonight. When Kaffa fell back then, they all were shook. Staring at Krohor, some men took out their swords, some took daggers, some demanded the child be cut out of the woman's belly there and then. If the destruction of the Crave Rua would come true and this, the prophecy the Kaffa was giving them, well, they only had one thing to do, it was clear to any one of them. Fergus MacRoy stood behind the young king. Fergus, who had previously been the king of Ulster, was quite glad now that he did not have to decide what it was they should do. His wife, 
Nessa, Niesa, the not-so-gentle one, had in some ways tricked him out of his kingship. While he was still king, you see, he had asked for her hand in marriage. She, the not-gentle one, had had a very difficult life full of vengeance. But she had found Kaffa and had a prophecy that she would give birth to a king, and so she only wanted her son to be king. The deal she struck with Fergus for her hand in marriage was simple, to allow her son Grohor the kingship of Ulster for a year and a day. And that way, the prophecy would be true. Fergus didn't rely on the fact that this woman had a sharp cunning and an edge that he did not see coming. And so, during that year, she guided and advised her son on exactly what he needed to do. In some ways, he was very generous to some of the great landowners and wealthy men of Ulster. In other ways, he was very kind and not so kind to some of the women, men and other ones in the province then. Equally distributing and sometimes not so equally distributing the wealth, stealing from the rich and giving to those that were poorer. In some ways, he always did what his mother advised. And so when it came to be the time for Fergus MacRoy to come back and claim his kingship, those that were wealthy and those that were not wealthy, they didn't see Fergus as someone they wanted to be their ruler. This young king, Crohor MacNassa, the son of Nasa, was far better than he had ever been. And after all, he had given up his kingship for a year and a day for a woman. So, they agreed. Crohor should be king. And Fergus, now looking at the young king, was quite relieved. He was surprised at what he said next, however. Crohor stood up. He looked at Felmid MacDall, his treasured storyteller and musician, and he knew this man would die with his wife if anyone went near their unborn child. He didn't want their blood on his hands this day and so early in his kingship. He didn't want the story of his young kingship to be of, of an innocent child. So, he decreed, this child will be born, and she will be called Deirdre, but she will go to the far north, to a lonely place to the quiet mountains, where Lowercombe, one of my most trusted servant women, will raise her, and there she will live alone with no man looking at her, no one finding out about her, until she comes of age, that I myself will marry her and place her on a pedestal. We will utilize her beauty in Ulster and galvanize the Crave Rua around her so no one would ever dare to attempt to take her away from Aumaka. Well, when his words were spoken, everyone thought he was very wise indeed. And they all agreed this was a decent choice. Phelamid MacDall was relieved and so his wife. And once everyone left, well, it wasn't long until she gave birth to a beautiful girl they called Deirdre. Deirdre was taken away from her parents, though, and brought up to the lonely, quiet places. Lowercombe bundled her in cloth, and she carried her off to the quiet, lonely mountains, and there a house that had been purpose-built into a hill itself so that you could not see it only on a very clear day would you see some smoke coming out in between the trees for you see even the roof itself was laden with earth and grass and shrubs grew all around it was built into the hillside and the hill that it was on gathered much mist and so no one would ever see them there in amongst the lonely hills of Ulster. Every now and again, Lowercombe would get help from a blind hunter, 
a man who would come and do some chores and jobs. But it was her chore to raise this child of Deirdre, teach her everything she knew when she was old enough to understand. She had a voracious appetite for knowledge and knowing how to fend for herself, and Lowercombe quickly realised needlework was not what she was going to learn best. She wanted to run and learn to hunt, even with the blind man she went out and learned how to set traps. As a young girl, she was wild and free, but even still, Lowercombe could see she was beautiful beyond compare. Her stunning complexion, her beautiful bright eyes, her long dark hair. Well, she would be a match for Kaffa's prophecy. She only hoped that Krohor would be able to fulfill his promise and keep her away from trouble. As she grew into herself, Deirdre became more daring more brilliant, more athletic, and more beautiful. Lowercombe could hardly say no to the girl. Anything she would do, she would do without really asking, and when she asked for forgiveness, Lowercombe always did. And yet still she taught her as much as she could the old stories and tried to fill her with some form of appetite for when she came of age and would marry Crohor Macnassa, the King of Ulster. Although Deirdre never really seemed to like listening to stories about Crohor, her future husband. Even though Lowercombe tried to tell her how beautiful he was, in fact, none of the women in Ulster would allow Crohor to wear a long tunic, so that he always wore a short one to show off his very muscular and defined calves, his best feature amongst many of the opinions of the women of Ulster. Still, Deirdre was disinterested. And one harsh and cold winter, when they were gathering the cloaks around them and the furs and hoping to keep themselves warm, the blind hunter came. And he came to kill a calf for them, to skin it and cut the fine meats for them to dry and to cook and to make a broth out of its bones to keep them warm in this harsh winter. The winds were picking up. A howling came across the land and Deirdre opened the door to see white meet her eyes. A heavy snow had fallen and there the hunter with his knife next to the calf's throat cut it sharply and the blood spilled out onto the white snow and a raven as dark as the blackest of blacks landed and as it pecked at the blood and the white snow Deirdre exclaimed that she would marry a man with those three colours hair as black as that raven cheeks as red as that blood and skin on his body as white as that snow. She fell to her knees, now knowing some form of longing building inside of her. Lowercombe was worried then. Crohor was fair-haired, fairly sallow, and, well, didn't have rosy cheeks, that was for sure. Didn't even have particularly red lips. She tried to dissuade Deirdre from going off on this story, but Deirdre would have none of it. She demanded to know which man in Ulster had those three colours. And she pined, and she asked, and she longed, and she would not let this subject go. Until finally Lowercombe agreed, there was one that sprang to mind. He was one of Grohor's nephews, in fact. One of the sons of Ishnak. Nisha was his name. But after answering, she said, that's enough now, we'll we'll keep on learning the stories. But Deirdre wanted to hear no more stories, unless they were about Nisha, one of the sons of Ishnak. Who were his brothers, Hanlan or Don? What did they do? They hunted all day and all night. 
In fact, the story was that they would sing in unison with great tones, low and high, mixing in such a melody that even the deer would stop from grazing and listen until they would leap out surrounding this prey and... Well, that was how the story went anyway. Deirdre would not have anything to do other than learn where these men would hunt. And she kept on asking, even though she was coming of age and she was soon to be going to Aonmaka to marry the king, she wouldn't go until she met Nisha. Lowercombe knew this was a bad idea, but she was so fond of her beautiful Deirdre, who was, in all extents and purposes, her daughter, really. She had raised this girl. Did she really want her to be locked up, away from the fun and the wildness that was in her heart and in her eyes, always? To be beside the king, in court, in the feasting halls? She couldn't really see it. And so, without really thinking it through, she said she would agree to do one thing. She would show Deirdre Nisha with her brothers Anla and Ordon when they were hunting out in the wild places. So when she went on a missive into town and she spread a rumour and got the message across to the sons of Ishnuk that there was great hunting up in a particular valley by the particular trees that her cottage was particularly placed in. Very quiet, very undisturbed. Soon enough, they heard an enchanting noise. The song of the sons of Ishna coming over the hills, and sure enough, it was them. And so Lowercombe brought Deirdre to the quiet glen, and she said they must stay and hide behind the great trees, as the birch and the oak, they were so wide now that they could easily disguise themselves looking between the leaves, but as soon as Deirdre laid eyes on Nisha with his shockingly dark black hair, as dark and black as the raven, his pale white skin and his rosy cheeks, while her heart leapt to her chest, she jumped out in front of him, Lowercombe looked away. When she met eyes with Nisha, time seemed to close in and slow down, and there and then a spark ripped right through the air, and there their glare, they stayed in this moment transfixed by each other's presence, eager to run, terrified and stopping. Eventually, Words came to Nisha's mouth, although they weren't the most elegant of words, and he was beginning to realize who this woman of the wild woods must be with her stunning beauty. He had heard the stories. He knew who she must be. Fair is the heifer that stands before me, he said. Her response was maybe not as you would expect. The heifers grow very strong when there is no bull around to tame them, she said. Nisha, wondering how to respond to that, (coughs) coughed slightly. I hear the greatest heifer in all the province and strongest among all is destined to tame you one day. Deirdre looked down and looked back up a cheeky grin on her lips and she said that she would prefer to choose between two bulls and a younger, stronger, more powerful bull that she saw before her would be her choice. Well, they had been getting step by step closer to each other as this over and back went and soon they were close enough to place a hand on each other just Tentatively, she placed her hand on his chest, he placed his hand on her shoulder and then her neck as she looked up, placed her other hand by his waist and suddenly they embraced. 
Anla and Ardon were watching, and they did not like the look of what they saw. They rolled their eyes and said, right, that's it. Because they knew their brother. They knew their brother very, very well, and when he found something he liked, he would do it no matter what. And now that he had found the prized possession of the King of Ulster, Crohor Macnassa, they knew quite well that he would happily elope with this woman. Even if the king was so furious as to bring down all of the Crave Rua to try and crush them, they decided there and then that they had better go with him. And that's exactly what they did. They eloped. They ran from the quiet places. Deirdre and Nisha falling in love with each other so brilliantly that no matter what happened, they would be safe in each other's company. Anla and Ardon didn't think they were very safe at all, as they had to keep on moving all throughout Ireland. For as soon as Laurakum came back to Awanmaka with the report that Deirdre had gone missing and no one had found the sons of Ishnuk, Crohor put two and two together pretty quickly. When he asked Laurakum, she could not deny it. And so he sent out messages, he sent out troops, he sent out an army to try and find them, but no track nor trace could be found of the sons of Ishnuk. And none of the Crave Rua wanted to face the brilliant warriors, as Fergus McRoy said, who had trained these young boys in the boys' troop. If every fighting man of Ulster was down and all of it empty, as long as the three sons of Ishnuk were there, they would fight off any enemy easily, for the sons of Ishnuk are as fierce as lions. So Deirdre was in good company. But it wasn't very long until they realised that they could not stay on the island of Ireland. For high hilled Alban, they left. They went on a boat across the waves over more than nine, but finally when they came to High Hilled Alban, they found a place more barren than even where she had grown up in Ulster. In the north, the rugged landscape was beauty in her eyes. Towns and fortresses, castles and cities had nothing, no interest for her. She wanted to be in the wild places. And eventually, well, Nisha, Anna and Ardon, they found a king in which they could offer their services to. And some say they were under the protection of this king near Loch Etiv in North Strathclyde. And there the sons built a house for Deirdre, a fortress for her, Dún Dardul, Deirdre's fortress. They lived happily there, and for long times, Deirdre would go out roaming in the landscape. She could hunt the wild game with the sons of Ishnak. They would offer their services to the king, all right. But they stayed hidden. They knew her beauty was too profound for anyone to ever come close. And so, they stayed and but they fought many battles for the king. And they came back to Deirdre there in her dun. And her life was isolated, but she was not lonely as long as she had her Nisha to come home to her. She spent long days looking across the barren landscapes, the great lake, even venturing out to the sea. And they spent many years away, although sometimes there was a messenger from Ireland come to try and trick them back to Ulster. Always they were sent on their way, Crohor's tentacles spreading still to try and clutch her back. She knew she could not though, and she begged Nisha to promise them to stay in High Hilled Alban. And as the years went by, they had a daughter, Ave Grainia and a son, Gaira, and their life was happy until a messenger from the king followed the sons of Ishnuk back to this house out of curiosity, wondering where they would go all this time. 
and he peered through a window, and when he saw the look of this woman, the stunning beauty, well, her face flushed to be gazed upon in such a way, and she looked out the window then to see a man scurrying and running off. She felt strangely betrayed, and stranger still to have that look of lust placed on her and before she had felt her rosy cheeks flush when she had met Nisha that was a look and a gaze that she had equaled in every inch but now she had been subject to a man's gaze that lusted and longed for her for just being as beautiful as she was it wasn't long until the king then started to place the sons of Ishnak out in front of any battle, any skirmish, anything that was dangerous they would be sent out to do. And sure enough, they knew this messenger must have run back and told the king of this woman's beauty so he may clutch and grasp and hold on to her, place her on a pedestal and let all the people come and see him next to her. They now knew they had to go off and they fled to an island on the sea and they were there for a time not as happy as they had been but still they were free Deirdre had a terrible dream then dark clouds had gathered the swooping and flapping of a terrible raven with black wings and it landed on her table and it went towards a pot of honey and it pecked at it until its beak was dripping with all of this honey and as it leapt to the air that honey was dripping turned red and blood dark and sickly dripped from its beak as it flew across the darkened sky. <laughs>